Please rise, District Court Department 6, back to session. Please be seated, come to order. <clears throat> Starting till one, I could potentially start a, around 10 30. We may wait a few minutes. We can start whenever you're ready. I'm mistaken. I'm not sure about Mr. Weirman's schedule. No, I, I mean, I'll be ready to start at 10 30. We prefer to okay. keep moving. So we'll plan for 10 30 tomorrow, and I'll do my best to be ready to go at that time. We'll probably be planning to start at uh, 10 on Thursday, just so you know and can plan. Anything 10 o'clock on Thursday, is that what you said, Jeff? Yes. Okay, thank you. One second. Anything else before I get the jurors? Yes. Yes, um, Your Honor, uh, I had been told that Mr. Copenhagen was captured by Ventura County, California's authorities and brought to the Ventura County Jail. Um, the court, we've sort of alluded to some evidence that's coming out that the back of his head was cut by a, or pounded into a, a nightstand. Uh, a week, well, a week later, uh, the medical records which we were told that the, our subpoena had been rejected, apparently was not, that the records had been sent to my office. Uh, per stipulation, um, apparently they're in Mr. Sue's office now. Per stipulation, we're going to open those, uh, scan them, send them to both parties without affecting the later admissibility thereof, subject, of course, to later objections on other grounds. Right. So I agree that we're, her, his assistant's going to scan them, we're going to look at them, and then we'll make, you know, any objections if we have to over that's okay, of course. Sure. At least we're starting to get some stuff in. Okay. Uh, that's it. All right. That's it. Progress. Yes, yes. progress is good. Council stipulate for the presence of the jury? Yes, sir. We've got stipulate. Okay, great. Next witness. Thank you. Our mistake called Jerry Bernoulli. testimony about the given section be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but true self -effect. Yes. Thank you. May we see that? Please state your complete name spelling both your first and last name of the record. Jerry Germanellian, J-E-R-I-D-E-R-M-A-N-E-L-I-A-N. Sexual assault nurse examiner. How long have you been employed as a sexual assault nurse examiner? Uh, nine, a little more than nine years. And how long have you been a registered nurse? Um, since 1981. A long time. Um, can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, your education and training that you had to receive? Number one, to be a registered nurse, and then number two, to be a sexual assault nurse examiner. Uh, I went to uh, Lake Superior State College in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and received an associate's degree in nursing, um, where I graduated in 1981. Um, in 1991, I went to UNLV, where I received my bachelor's in nursing. Um, every uh, two years, I required uh, in the state, by the State Board of Nursing to have continuing education units to keep your current license. Um, if you specialize in certain regions, um, for example, uh, as a 
registered nurse that worked primarily in the uh, adult uh, emergency department, pediatric ER, and trauma. I had two certifications um, at the time that I was working in that area as a certified emergency nurse, critical care registered nurse. Um, in addition to that, um, I am a sexual assault nurse examiner for adolescents, pediatrics, and adults. So in order to become a SANE trained nurse, I took a 40-hour class um, from the owners of Rose Heart. And uh, from there, they would have me do um, clinical practice, doing sexual assault exams with the physicians and the nurses. Uh, I took a national uh, test from the International Association of Forensic Nursing for the pediatrics and then the adolescents and the adults, and I maintained that. Now, every three years you have to take uh, and show the uh, International, International Association of Forensic Nursing that you maintain your competency by doing clinical exams and by doing continuing education units. Generally, there's about 45 that are required for the uh, pediatrics, adolescents, and the adults every three years. In addition to that, my work history is um, I started out working in EA Nevada. Um, I came out from the uh, Detroit, Michigan area. Went to EA, worked for four and a half years in their um, hospital, which is a rural hospital. Uh, it was about 31 beds at the time that I worked there. I would be the only registered nurse on working the, the afternoon shift. So I, I learned to deliver babies, handle anything that came into the ER, worked in the pediatric area, had a three-bed ICU. <coughs> it's general practice nursing, a little bit of everything. From there, I came down to University Medical Center and in 1986 started working at UMC, where I did 30 years of work there before I retired. <coughs> um, I worked primarily in the emergency setting, so I worked in the ER for adult pediatrics and trauma. I also did three years in the open heart unit um, where I worked like three 12 hour shifts in the ER and then two 12 hour shifts in the open heart unit. In addition to that, I worked four and a half years while I was working full time at UMC. I worked almost five years at St. Rose Dominican Hospital. I would work minimum 32 hours a week in the ER and the ICU. In addition to that, I own a small company called Academy for Career Enhancement where I teach educational programs. <coughs> I have taught the 40-hour sexual assault exam course to other nurses, um, and I teach various number of classes, including advanced cardiac life support, trauma nurse core courses, and, and some of the other classes that I teach. That's part of my work history. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear, well, first of all, which hospitals do you work here in the Valley? I'm contracted with the University Medical Center. And let's say someone um, is taken to a different hospital, hospital and they have been sexually assaulted. Are there times where you actually will uh, travel to other hospitals within the valley and do the sexual assault nurse examination if they can't be brought to you? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, can you give a brief description of what a sexual assault nurse examiner does? What are your job duties? Uh, the duties are to take a medical history from the patient, inform them what their choices are, talk to them about the sexual assault, um, uh, administer a head-to-toe assessment, which may or may not include a full pelvic exam or full anal exam. If they take a forensics portion of the exam, we take photographs with a, a camera system called Secure Digital Forensics Imaging. Uh, we offer antibiotics generally or make recommendations for antibiotics to be given as a prophylactic treatment for venereal disease or sexually transmitted infections. Gonorrhea and chlamydia will ask for or make recommendations. Um, in our program, we'll draw their blood for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, <coughs> and syphilis status. When we're doing the pelvic, we'll gather a gonorrhea and chlamydia culture from the cervical velocity universe and submit that to the lab. <clears throat> we talk to them about pregnancy, um, urine drug screens are done, and then we offer the morning after medication if that's appropriate to stop and they give them a sperm from uniting it. If they don't have any cultural or religious issues, that I don't tell them they can't <clears throat> take medication. We give them a referral to the Clark County Health District if they don't have a primary care doctor because in 12 weeks they'll need an additional uh, second HIV and syphilis test. And then we generally will ask permission to have the Great Crisis Advocates come out and assist them with um, gaining access to the programs that the Great Crisis has 
which would include um, the advocate portion as well as counseling. We use a lot of tools, so I'll do the sexual assault exam, which can include a pelvic or a speculum exam <coughs> for a female. We can use light standing microscopes. We use uh, crowd lights. Um, and I will record a session, particularly if they're out of my normal element, if I'm not at UMC, um, which I did in this case. Okay. And um, you used a couple of terms. So you use, um, a, did you say, a, a staining process? Yes, we use a uh, blue dye called Tolvadine blue dye to um, assess if we have any like micro abrasions that may not show up readily for um, like for the jury's eyes and sometimes for my eyes too. So sometimes there may be an abrasion that the, the naked eye can't see right away? That's correct. And then when you apply the blue dye, um, does it allow those to be uh, more visibly seen? Yes. Okay. Um, so if, if you wouldn't mind, instead of saying sexual, <coughs> sexual assault nurse examination, we commonly refer to that as a SANE. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, when individuals are brought to the emergency room to see you, um, does everyone who comes for a sexual assault nurse examination um, go forward, forward with a report to the police? Yeah. Do patients have a choice um, in which they can get the exam done, but don't necessarily want to deal with the police? Uh, yes, there are exceptions to that rule. The State Board of Nursing states as mandatory reporters that if there's a gun involved in a crime, we have to report. If there's a knife involved in a crime, we have to report. If we assess the patient and we are looking at a loss of life or limb, we're going to uh, be mandated to call that in. And if you're in the protected class under the age of 18, over the age of 60, um, uh, very young and very old are in the protected class, you're mandated to call that in. Now, if you could um, walk us through, someone comes to you and they need a sexual assault, a sexual assault nurse examination to be done. Can you walk us through the steps and in, in how it is that you conduct this exam? The patients can present uh, one of multiple different ways. I mean, one of them is they can walk in through, you know, the adult, into an adult emergency department. Um, they can be brought in by ambulance, so they would enter through the ambulance entrance. They can come in through trauma resuscitation, or if they're under the age of 18, they could enter through the pediatric uh, process. Um, any way that they enter into a system, once it's identified that they're a victim of a sexual assault, um, uh, or stating that they're a victim of a sexual assault, then the law enforcement would be offered to them, um, or the sexual assault nurse examiner would be called to go through the options with the patient as to which type of exam they would want done. So there's a lot of different mechanisms on how the process gets started. And then once the process is started, can you walk us through just like the physical things that you do with the patient? Sure. Uh, identify yourself to the patient and the first thing you try and establish a rapport with them and let them know that they're in control of the exam and that they're not there to tell them what to do, that they have choices, and then uh, generally you go through a medical history. One of the most important pieces is the medical history so that we can try and identify the other injury patterns that we may find might be new, might be old, might be caused from a medical condition versus from a trauma-related issue. Uh, once we're done with the medical history, then we'll go through the general options with the patients. They generally have four as an adult. And then we answer all the questions for that. We'll ask them about the sexual assault. Where, where do they want to start? How do they want to start? What do they want to tell us? And then generally, we go from there with more specific questions based off how they present. Once they make a decision on the uh, option that they choose, we'll ask them to sign a consent for that option. And then we start generally at that point, we'll go with the head to assessment, which may or may not include taking photographs of the patient's entire body. And then we'll go through literally head to toe where we look at the head and go on all the way down on the feet. We look, listen, and feel to their bodies and talk to them the entire time while we're doing the physical exam, while we're touching them and, and feeling and listening to their lungs and their heart and whatnot. Uh, oh, I apologize. I was going to say after the, the external exam, we also do an internal yeah. Then we move on towards uh, the pelvic portion of the exam and uh, then we'll move into the anal portion of the exam. 
The pelvic portion of the exam is preferred to be done in a lobotomy position, which means that the patient is on their, uh, for a female patient, they're on their back, and will put their uh, heels generally in stirrups. It's much like a, a woman going into a doctor's office to have uh, what, what is called a pap smear. And then we ask them to allow their knees to fall apart, and uh, we'll go ahead and take photographs of the <coughs> external genitalia region. The physical exam of the external genitalia region. Um, use the Ptolemy blue dye at the certain areas of the external genitalia area. Uh, place the speculum, look at the walls of the brain or cervix, and then uh, take the cultures and the swabs as needed. Place those in the sexual assault kit. Uh, then, generally, the rectal exam would be done after the speculum exam is done. And the rectal exam generally is in a knee chest position, can, but can also be done on a person's side with their knees drawn up the best that they can underneath their chin, laying on one side or the other. Or we look at the perianal folds, uh, the rectum, and we take swabs from the rectum. <coughs> we take photographs also of uh, any injuries that we may see um, that may or may not include the uh, external genitalia, the rectum, or the entire body of the Once we're done with that, then, uh, depending on what we find, um, if anything is found that's life threatening, uh, we'll stop and we we'll get the patient into, you know, the, to be seen by the docs and, and take care of the airway, breathing, circulation related issues. <clears throat> Rarely does that happen, but it has to happen on a rare occasion. Uh, and then once we're done with that, we'll uh, talk to the patient. If we haven't obtained the blood or the blood samples, generally we'll do it at that point in time and then <clears throat> talk to them about questions that they have. And we're constantly talking to the patients. We ask a lot more questions than we write down sometimes, and then we will talk to them about the antibiotic choices and whether the morning after medication is appropriate for them. Or a lot of times we'll just ask them what, what fears they have or what are they feeling, or how can we help them generally. And then we get the advocates in to help them. We generally give them discharge instructions, which include a reminder of when they go for their second blood test, and uh, we'll talk to them about if they have specific medical needs, like if they need to see in a, a tub of hot water as a sits bath for healing processes, or if they need a tetanus shot, or, or something of that nature, we'll, we'll take care of all that. And then the patients are <coughs> um, connected with the big crisis um, So, is it fair to say that depending on what the patient is telling you, that kind of dictates um, the what you will need to do during that exam. Is yeah. that fair? That's fair to say. Um, so for instance, if someone says that they were forced to perform oral sex on someone, you wouldn't necessarily do a rectal exam. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, would you say that information gathering <laughs> is an important part of your process while you're doing the exam or right before the exam? Yes, the medical history is one of the most important things we do as well as history of the event. So like for example, when you say history of the event, does that include like the location of the incident? Yes. Okay. Um, so what is the date and time of the incident? Yes. And then do you also record the time of the exam? Yes. Why, are, why is it important to document those things? I'm trying to establish a timeline so that when I'm looking for physical injuries, I'm trying to assess when the injuries occurred and what kind of injury patterns I may or may not see. Sometimes it takes a while for uh, injury patterns to present, and then sometimes they show up right away, depending on the amount of energy force, the type of the body tissue that was involved, a lot of different factors as to go into. But a timeline is important for us to try and establish um, from the, generally we'll do an exam up to three to five days post sexual assault. It's also important for us to find out what's been done prior to coming in to the hospital for the exam. Have they, you know, changed their clothes? Have they showered? Have they urinated? Have they defecated? Have they brushed their teeth? Have they, you know, used a tampon or removed a tampon? Or have they used a carry pad in their underpants? Are they still wearing the same underpants? Or uh, we ascertain that information so that we know where the um, forensics information is. And in regards to conduct previous assault, is it also important to you know um, whether they've engaged in consensual sexual intercourse or you know something such as rough sex or the like previous to the assault? We always ask when was the last consensual intercourse, and 
the last questions about mm -hmm. when you're last going to cause the jet pain. And then it depends on how the patient answers the question as to whether you start rolling down the road of um, is there a rough intercourse that takes place in your consensual world? And then we go down another pathway once we find out that they uh, use the term rough, then we have to find out what does that mean to them. We go down that pathway. Now, um, do you also ask specific questions about the assault? And when I, wait, when I say specific, like, do you ask um, whether or not they were penetrated? Yes. Um, and by what? Whether it be a finger, or a tongue, uh, an object, etc. That's correct. Um, do you ask whether or not there was any genital bleeding? Yes. Uh, genital pain? Yes. Uh, whether or not there was ejaculation? Yes. Whether or not the female is on is menstruating? Yes. And why are these types of questions important for your assessment and treatment? Uh, they will guide uh, the path of what we're looking for from a perspective of both medically and from a forensic standpoint. So if a patient has uh, bleeding after having intercourse, is that something that occurs on a consensual basis or is it happening this time when there, there was uh, non-consent? Um, you'll ask questions about um, whether your menstrual period is beginning, middle flow, or end flow, because as you know, when blood comes out of the cervix, it's going to brush across the, the vaginal walls, and that may help eliminate DNA. <coughs> where either the doctor or the nurse, the nurse um, goes over the details uh, that the individual gives. Yes. And is that part of the medical record process as well? Yes. And you said in some situations when you're outside uh, your normal environment, like at the University of Medical Center, you will also uh, record the statement or the narrative that the patient gives. Is that correct? Yes. And why is, it, why is that done in a, in a hospital that you normally don't work at? Uh, I don't have all the tools. I don't have the ability to um, read the chart generally. I don't have access to all the same tools that I normally would have at uh, the hospital or do the majority of my exams. Um, it's a foreign environment to me. Um, uh, so we may not have like a pelvic bed. There's a lot of different variables that change when you go into another person's house, so to speak, to do an exam. Um, and so uh, I record and then I transcribe the, the recording so that I have an accurate um, information on what the patient is telling me. Okay. Um, and then lastly, you spoke about um, doing swabs. Um, can you explain why you do those and the importance of those? Uh, the sexual assault kit has uh, uh, boxes, small boxes with long, elongated Q-tips in them that are sterile. Generally, we take swabs from the back of the throat, the cheeks, the hands, the vagina, the cervix, the rectum, and then anywhere else on the body that, uh, based off the history that they give us, that we would um, potentially find DNA. If the crime light happens to tell us that we may have a fluid or a fluid on the body from the crime light, we'll swab that area. You know, that's not a uh, specific, that's a uh, generalized finding that we find when we uh, shine the body with uh, what we call a crime light. Thank you. All right, so now I'd like to ask you some specific questions about a sexual assault nurse examination that you conducted on August 8th of 2014. Um, on that day, were you working at University Medical Center or were you off on that day? Uh, I was working. And did you get called to do a SANE exam um, at Sunrise Hospital? I did. And upon arrival, did you conduct the sexual assault nurse examination on a 23-year-old female by the name of Lucy Mastic? I did. And um, what generally information were you given as to why Ms. McIndate was brought to the hospital and in need of your, your cat care? Uh, she had sustained uh, uh, blunt force trauma. I was told that there was a knife involved, so it could have been penetrating trauma. She was seen by trauma resuscitation at Sunrise Medical Center and admitted to the trauma ICU. Um, there also was history that there was fingers placed to the vagina, and so that is the sexual assault piece. And so I was requested to go to the trauma ICU at Sunrise to do a sexual assault exam. Okay. Now, um, we just went in depth about you know the information gathering process and why you need that information. <coughs> Uh, did you go through that whole process with Ms. McIndy when you treated her? Uh, yes. 
what was her demeanor um, <coughs> upon your treatment of her, or upon your arrival? Uh, she uh, allowed us to come into the room, and, and she allowed me to introduce myself and explain why I was uh, brought there. Uh, detective Law from here uh, was the detective that requested that I go to Sunrise, and he actually met me there at Sunrise to escort me out to the trauma I see because I, I don't I'm going to guess this is entirely not responsive. Well, so go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, so my question is, is in just is what information were you given that caused you to go to treat Miss McIndy at the Sunrise Hospital? Uh, Detective Lafreniere requested that I go offer a sexual assault exam to the patient. Um, and then I also, I believe I asked you what her demeanor was upon your arrival, and you said she was cooperative. She was cooperative. Um, what, and in regards, was she emotional? How was that aspect of her demeanor. Uh, she answered my questions that I asked and she um, talked freely uh, about the event and cooperated with the examination. Can you tell me uh, what time was the exam given? Uh, I was at sunrise at approximately 15.30, uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay. And um, <coughs> What time was the uh, what time was the report that the assault had occurred? Uh, she gave a time frame of zero one thirty to zero three o'clock or one thirty in the morning to three o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Um, and during the information process, was she able to discuss? Or I mean, was she able to discuss? Uh, who it was that had done this to her. Yes. Was she able to identify that person? <clears throat> she gave uh, a name and uh, stated that this was her boyfriend of approximately 15 months. Did she arrive via ambulance? <clears throat> that I don't know. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> may I approach your honor? Yes. Would looking at a copy of her report help refresh your recollection in regards to how she got to the hospital? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead and read that to yourself silently and let me know when you're After reading that, does that help refresh your recollection? She came with my Thank you. Now, had she um, changed clothes or, you know, the questions that, let me strike that question for sure. Uh, the question that we've gone through before whether or not a patient um, has changed their clothes, eaten, drink. Uh, did she answer those questions? Yes. And what is it that she had done uh, previous to coming in? I'm going to object that I'm going to call it your son. Would you like to go ahead?
Um, all right, so let's go back for a second. Um, in regards to sexual assault nurse examinations that you do at the hospital, is the purpose for, is the purpose of sexual assault nurse examination for uh, medical assessment and treatment or for law purposes? Uh, it can be a combination of both. Okay. You do do a medical uh, history taking, you do a medical assessment. When you find medical conditions that require medical treatment, we have protocols that we can use to administer medications to the patient. For example, for the nauseated, we have an order for Zofran, which is an anti-medic, which we can give the patient. And then the uh, examination also includes the law enforcement piece if the patient chooses that portion. Now, the information that you are gathering when, the, the, you know, the information that we spoke about, um, you said that you gather information about uh, facts related to the assault, whether or not the person has eaten or drank anything, those things. Are those statements given to assess the patient what type of treatment is needed, or are those statements um, received for law purposes? Um, if you're going to weigh that question, I would say more for law enforcement, but also that crosses over into the medical portion of the examination also. Why is that needed for the assessment and medical card examination? Um, if the patient has not urinated since the exam, one of the questions would be, you know, when was the last time you urinated? That may lead you to a medical condition that's going to require medical treatment. Um, if the patient has uh, vomited, you need to find out you know, how many times have you found it and is there something else going on that leads you to another set of medical conditions that may require medical treatment. And forgive me because I think I already asked you this earlier, but I, I kind of want to reword it. Yes. For instance, sure. if during the assault um, the individual says, uh, you know, they're it was either digital penetration or rubbing of the inside of the vagina. You may not go ahead and do a full pelvic exam or a full anal exam um, because of the information that was given. Is, is that correct as well? Yes, and the patient is going to make the decision ultimately. It's explained to them why, you know, we may want to do the speculum exam and the patient can decline that. Then we come back and let them know why we may want to do the speculum exam. They ultimately will tell us whether we're allowed to do that or not. Okay. So in regards to um, the questions um, about facts, you know, whether or not clothes have been changed, uh, drinks, eating, eating food, was Ms. McIndae able to tell you the answers to those questions? Yes. Okay. Um, had she changed her clothing? Yes. Um, did, had she drank any fluids? Yes. And had she eaten any foods? No. And uh, had she urinated? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to object again and ask the approach. Unless the Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, Nurse Dermaley. Um, I had just asked.
ask you some questions generally in regards to the information gathering process. And now I want to talk specifically about the information gathering process in this case. The information um, gathering that you did with Ms. McIntyre, was that for the purposes um, of assessing and treating Ms. McIntyre in the course of uh, her stay at the hospital? In this case, the answer would be no. She was being well taken care of by the trauma resuscitation doctors at Sunrise Hospital. My job primarily was to do the forensic evidence collection, and she chose that. And was any part of the information that you gathered from her, um, were you, was any of that information that you gathered from her for medical purposes at all, or treatment and assessment? Uh, recommendations were made to the hospital regarding medical treatment for the sexually transmitted infections. And so I don't have privileges to, at Sunrise Hospital, all I can do is make recommendations. Whereas when I'm at UMC, we have standing orders where I can go get the medications and make the recommendations and administer the medications. So the answer to that question would be yes? Yes. So the information you gathered from her, there was a legal aspect to it? Yes. And there was a medical aspect to it? Yes. And based on the information she gave you during the examination, um, were you able to assess what type of treatment or what type of examination you should give to her in regards to a pelvic exam, an ankle <coughs> exam, et cetera? Yes. Now, um, sorry, can you interrupt for just a second? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, so I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I clearly understand. When you were asking these questions of Ms. McIntyre and going through some of the things that Ms. Booth has been asking you about, were you asking questions to gather information for medical diagnosis or medical treatment? Uh, yes, with making recommendations, and I don't have access to giving her actually technical right. medications. So, so you personally weren't going to provide the medical treatment, but Correct. the information, is it fair to say the information you were gathering was for that purpose? Yes, part of that is if I find information, I relay it to the staff at Sunrise to pass on to the trauma doctors so that they can make an assessment and make the decision whether they're going to act on the information that I give them from a medical perspective. Anybody approach? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, that you receive. You ask um, 
whether or not there has been penetration. Yes. Okay. Now, um, before we get into specifically with Ms. McIndy, and I believe I asked you this earlier, but depending on the answer that the patient gives, does that dictate the type of exam that can follow in most cases? Yes. When you asked Ms. McIndy whether or not there was penis to vagina penetration, what was her answer? No. Um, when you asked her if there was, let me see my letters again, I'm sorry, just the first one, thank you so much. Um, when you asked her if there was penetration, um, what is it that, she, how is it that she explained to you that penetration had occurred? Uh, she indicated that there were two or three fingers that were placed at the, just above her rectum and pulled up towards the uh, labia majora and went up to where the uh, area where she urinates from. She stated it was two or three fingers and that it was wet in sensation of feeling. Dr. can we please treat this just as a continuing objection? Yes. Uh, so, uh, correct. We can talk about that again after the jury's done today. Now, in re in regards to um, penetration into the vaginal hole, um, did she state that, that the fingers did not go into the vaginal hole itself? Yes. Um, but rather inside the, the labia majora, around the menorah? Yes. Now, I'm not getting into the statements um, that Ms. McIndy made. Um, was she able to discuss with you whether or not there had been um, any prior violence within the relationship um, before this incident? Yes. Um, was she able to discuss with you whether or not there had been any prior sexual violence um, within this relationship? Yes. As part of the exam, um, when you did your head-to-toe examination, did you document um, the external injuries to Ms. McIndy? Like by photography, did you document the external injuries to her body? Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I apologize because I need to go back one step in regards to the examination that you did of Ms. McIndy's uh, vagina. With the information that she had given you in regards to the level of penetration, did you do a full pelvic examination where you use, um, I'm losing the name starts with an S, speculum, speculum um, where you did a full speculum examination? No. Okay, and why is it that you did not do that? The patient uh, requested, if at all possible, not to do a speculum exam. She did not want the speculum put into her vagina. <coughs> Based off the information that she gave me, uh, I did not place the speculum into her vagina at that time. I did take swabs from the vaginal wall and place those in the sexual assault kit. Now, based on the information you were given um, from the from Ms. McIndy, where she stated that uh, three fingers were used to wipe kind of the inside of the labia majora, um, did you expect to find like traumatic findings to the vagina itself? No. Why not? She indicated that she felt a wet sensation on the fingers that went from the bottom up to the top of where she urinated from. Uh, she did not indicate that she had pain at that time uh, from that, the fingers touching the uh, mons pubis and the labia majora. Um, and for the record, what is the mons pubis? Uh, the mons pubis is an area of the body that covers the uh, pubic symphysis bone, and it's, uh, some people, lay people will call it the fat pad. 
um, where when women have estrogen influx or flow, um, the body places a cap of fat over that area to help uh, bumper uh, um, and to um, tolerate um, intercourse with the touching that occurs when both pelvises touch each other. In addition to that, the mons pubis um, has pubic hairs that grow, and the pubic hairs have their job to do okay. as well. Um, and so you didn't expect to see any sharp force or blunt force um, you know, trauma findings to her vagina due to the history she gave? Uh, I did not suspect any acute blunt force trauma findings would be found correct. Okay. Now, um, moving back to my other question where I had spoke about um, when you did the head to toe examination, did you document um, Ms. Backenday's injuries on what's referred to as a, a body sheet? Uh, yes. Okay. And I'm going to approach to see if you recognize this. I'm showing you what's been marked for purposes of identification as state's proposed exhibit 187. Yes. Yes. Sorry. That's okay. Um, and do you recognize this? Yes. And what is this? Uh, that's an anatomical drawing sheet that I used to uh, document some of the injury patterns that I saw on the patient. Okay. And is this, in fact, um, dated by you August 8th of 2014 and signed by you? Yes. And does it have the patient's name on the top of it? Yes. Okay. And is this a fair and accurate copy of the body sheet that you did in regards to the head-to-toe examination? Yes. Okay. And, Your Honor, at this time I move to admit into evidence states proposed 187. Any objection to 187? No objection. No objection. 187 is admitted. May I have permission to publish on it? Yes, go ahead. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to ask you some questions uh, in regards to some photographs. But if you wouldn't mind, I'm showing you now what's in evidence that states 187. And I'll zoom out. <coughs> Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the, in, the injuries that we're looking at? And if you wouldn't mind, if we could start from um, the left. I guess that's my left. I think it would be your left, too. And moving to the right about what you were looking at and what you were notating. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to zoom in and do one body at a time. If that's okay with you. Can you see that okay, Ms? Yeah. So um, at the top of the head, there appeared to be a scab and a puncture wound uh, noted with a little black round uh, marking. Um, and above the uh, patient's right ear, there was a scab noted. On her right shoulder, she had uh, surface trauma uh, that was noted with uh, skin that was uh, microabrasioned off. Um, on the lower extremity at the knee level on her right, um, she had injury patterns that were present, and I did not write specifically what they were on this anatomical drawing. And, and that's on the knee and then on the kind of below the knee as well? Yep, that's called the tip fib or the tibia and the fibula lower portion of the leg. Um, was Miss uh, McIntyre, <coughs> when you did the assault history, was she able to discuss with you whether or not a weapon was used during um, the assault? Uh, she did. Okay, and now I'm going to move to <coughs> the second body, and if you could explain what we're looking at here. <coughs> I indicated that she had a contusion or a bruise uh, noted to the right eye. Um, she also had in the white part of the eye uh, something called a subconjunctival uh, sclera noted on the right eye that's bleeding into the white portion of the uh, eyeball that you see. Um, she had a uh, swollen lip that was noted that I wrote down. On the left, uh, we call it the orbit of the eye, um, she had uh, uh, bruising, swelling, and she had uh, dry blood crusted on the uh, both nostrils of her nose. On her um, left upper femur, upper leg, she had a scab noted there. 
as well as above the left knee. She had a scab noted there. And uh, below the knee on her left, she had scabbing noted there. Um, she had a blue contusion noted on the above the uh, right knee noted. And then below the right knee on the lower tip fib, she had multiple uh, contusions that were noted or bruises. Previously, we had, I think we had both used the term blood force trauma and sharp force trauma. Can you please explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the difference between those two things? Uh, blood force trauma is when you have an energy force that's applied to a portion of your body. Your body will try and absorb that energy force, but at some point the, uh, the ability of the skin or the muscles uh, to tolerate that energy force is exceeded, and then you can have an injury pattern occur underneath the skin. Uh, penetrating trauma is when you have um, generally a energy force that has caused like, tearing to occur, um, to like the skin or the muscle area, or you can have an energy force that causes the opening of the skin or the muscles. It can affect the bone and the underneath process, uh, your organs of your body, if it's in the general chest or abdomen, or, or like the muscles of your leg. Now I'll we'll move on to the third body. Now I'm just going to go up to the head because that was what was documented on the back of the head. Uh, uh, the two linear lines um, represent the mohawk the haircut that she had. So that was where the majority of the hair was, was in between the two lines that were noted here. Um, and then she had on the right side of the head an abrasion that was noted there. And she also had on the left side of the mohawk an abrasion and uh, erythema or redness noted there. Okay. And then the last body, do you mind putting Mr. Stevens? <clears throat> on the last body, please. On the uh, left side of her head, inside the ear, she had dried blood noted on the inside of the ear and on the outside. Uh, below that, she had scabbing noted on the left side of the, would be considered the occiput or the lateral wall of the neck region. She had scabbing noted there. On her left femur, she had a purple and brown uh, abrasion and uh, it was 20 centimeters by uh, 15 centimeters um, and then a contusion noted above that that was purple in color. Okay. I'll interrupt just one moment while on the lateral wall of her left femur. 
that was um, the contusion and there's an abrasion noted right here. This is contusion, that's the abrasion, and then above that, the more superior down here, if you can pull the photo up please a little bit. Sure thing. Um, and can you get rid of the purple? Yeah. Thank you. Um, that is the superior contusion I was talking about. It's going more towards the back of, almost to the bottom of Thank that you. over. And then um, you had noted several uh, scabs. I'm going to show you state 181. Is that one of uh, the scabs that you had documented? Uh, yes. Also in 183 as well? Yes. Um, 184? Yes. And then also in 173? Uh, yes. Sorry. So some, I want to, in regards to your uh, findings that were not noted in photography, uh, did you know that there were multiple contusions to her tongue? Uh, yes, I, I, in photograph. Yeah, um, what, and what is a contusion to a tongue? Can you explain what a contusion is? It's a bruise to the actual tongue itself. Um, it can be various different colors. Um, and it can occur during uh, you know, the assault. Um, it's important to ascertain what, were these injury patterns present prior to the assault or did they occur as a result of the assault? Um, you notated linear and is it striations? Yes. Uh, linear, linear striations and abrasions to the, her inner thighs. Yes. Can you explain what that is? Uh, striations are like uh, marks that line up almost parallel. Um, and some people would describe them as it looks like they're like really grooves to the skin. Um, we see striations frequently in uh, uh, muscles that have been stretched uh, very quickly, or like when people have a sudden weight gain, sometimes you'll see the striation marks made in the skin from um, that. Um, after you did both your external and internal examination, um, did you notate or prescribe to the treating hospital physicians that she would need any medications or shots? I made recommendations to the staff on the um, baseline sexually transmitted infection blood testing that we would request and the antibiotic administration that we would have uh, re made recommendations and requested that they administer. Um, did you discuss with her any future care both mentally and or physically? Uh, yes, I indicated it would be to her benefit to meet with the rape crisis advocates and then ultimately go see the rape crisis counselors so that uh, she could receive the help that she needed from a uh, psychological standpoint. And then it, I asked the patient if she would mind coming to UMC when she was discharged. I asked her how long she anticipated, the doctors told her how long she'd stay in the hospital. Um, and then I uh, asked her if she would be willing to come in and for a reassessment. And she indicated at that time that she would. Subsequently, she, she actually did not come in for a reassessment. Um, and then she was given information to follow up in 12 weeks for the second HIV and the second syphilis test to be done. And for the reassessment, when you said reassessment, that was at your request to document um, the staging of her injuries, is that right? Uh, yes. And so the point of that, would that be, you know, if someone has a bruise that looks a certain way on Monday, you then like to see what it looks like on the following Monday? It, it uh, helps in the, uh, you know, the assessment uh, and the clinical findings um, as to what, how new or to a jury reviews how fresh an injury pattern may be. Um, and if photographs had been taken at a you know at a later time by either a crime scene analyst or another investigative agency, would she need to go back to you in order to uh, assess those pictures if they were taken by someone else or assess those injuries? 
No, I would want her to come back so I could see her to finish my conclusion of my clinical findings. It uh, helps me to be able to give the information correctly to you. And would would you have done any more examination to the vagina, or would that just be to the external injuries? It would have been to the external body. Okay, thank you so much. Your Honor, that concludes my direct examination. All right. All right, folks, so um, we're going to go ahead and break for the night. Uh, we are planning to start at 1030 tomorrow. I'll try not to be waiting like today. I do my best on that. Uh, during this recess, you're in